Peter, Peter Boom is a Coast Salish artist and a member of the Upper Skagit tri Tribe of Washington State. He works in a variety of mediums, but is best known for his graphic work and interestingly enough, rattles, right? I, I, was, I was like, I didn't know, yeah, rattles. So you'll probably see some of those tonight. Um, as a speaker, Peter is engaging, humorous, and warmly shares both the historical and artistic elements of Salish art. As an active member of his community, Peter enjoys giving back. He's um, printed and introduced the work of many artists who were previously under the radar and who otherwise would have not had the opportunity to have their work printed. Um, he continues to strive toward the expansion of tribal, tribal art and his work is kind of everywhere. And on the little blurb on the website, you guys can go see that. But Peter, you just had a great quote on your website about art is all around us and art is everywhere in life. And you know that's where I our title came that um, intrinsically connected. I just, I think that was such a beautiful quote. So um, Peter is also a lawyer um, and he can tell you a little bit more about that. So he um, is one of those people that works a lot and, and does a lot. And um, Peter, when you introduce yourself, if you could tell us a little bit about our free will offering is gonna go to Spaceworks Tacoma. Um, and so um, as always, you can send it to the church or you can go on our website and give. Um, one of us will pop the link into the chat. Um, but um, anything that you can give, we love to pass on our speaker series has um, given over $4,000 to the community. And I just think that is a pretty awesome thing. Um, you know, it's not big amounts, but it sure has added up and every little penny I think makes a difference somewhere. All right, Peter, it's all yours, go for it. Put it all up and now they're gonna be all disappointed, right? <clears throat> so, um... As far as the way this goes tonight, since we're only a few people on Zoom, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna share my screen. I've got a PowerPoint, which uh, I'm not really a huge PowerPoint fan. Generally, I did go to graduate school and we, we listened to PowerPoint presentations for hours on end. So I made use of that time by doing other things when the PowerPoint was up and I generally don't like them. However, when you're talking about art and when you're talking about um, visual things, it's always good to have a visual and PowerPoint is really good for that. So I'm gonna share my screen. I'll go through the PowerPoint. At any point in time, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, complaints, you wanna argue, let's go for it. I'm, I'm down for that. As Gretchen said, my name is Peter Boom. I am a member of the Upper Skagit Tribe in Washington State. My wife is Puyallup, um, so we live in the Tacoma area. She's uh, actually in-house counsel for her tribe. Our kids are also all Puyallup. Four kids, two girls, two boys. Uh, they're actually not kids anymore. Our oldest is 28 and our youngest is 16. And pretty proud of them. So I will go through the PowerPoint and the first half of it, the first, I wouldn't say half of it, the first bit of it is a little about foundational stuff in history. And then the last half of it, more than half, substantially more than half, the last bit of it is just my work. And I don't normally like to do that when I'm talking about Salish work, but for this particular event that the PowerPoint was created for, they asked me specifically for my work. And that's what Gretchen, her emails said, hey, we want you to do the same PowerPoint. I did add a couple of pictures to it because I have since the, the last one, I believe is August, I have completed a mural and have completed some of the works that were in progress during that time. So I included those photos. All right. Oops, let me see, I gotta go back now. I should probably share the screen and then do it. All right. All right, here we go. So as we said, so I, this isn't my work. I love this, this uh, cartoon because it is so indicative of the life of an artist. And it's so very true. I, I grew up in a environment 
But I was I was always just kind of an artist. That's who I am as a human being. That's who I am as a person. But I was always discouraged from trying to pursue it professionally. Teachers, family, folks were like, you will never, ever make it as an artist. And having had many jobs and sat in some cubicles and done some things, the second caption of that cartoon is so incredibly true. Nobody ever tells you how difficult it is to not be an artist. And so this is kind of my philosophy on living, especially for the last few years. So Coast Salish, when we talk about Coast Salish, what do we mean by that, of course? Salish is, it's a group of people. It's a language group, primarily. And so there's two, I've got two maps here. And so we can see on, on this, this is the Salish area, this whole interior of Vancouver Island, all the way through the Puget Sound. And this is broader, from a broad base that we're looking at, it, this is where Coast, pe Coast Salish people are. The second map here, it includes like Macaw and Chulith and all that. They're actually not Salish people. They have a different language. They have different style, different things like that. So as we move up and down the coast, Coast Salish is the southern tip of Northwest coastal art. We're about we're as far south. So people think of Northwest coast art. They think of totem poles. They think of longhouses. They think of stuff like that. We actually didn't have totem poles down here. We're, we are the southern tip. And as you move up the coast, there are different language groups within it. And so from here to Alaska along the coast is about 3,000 miles. Well, that's 2,000 something, 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 which is actually about the same distance from here to New York to give you kind of a geographical space. So when people think that all Northwest Coast art is the same, that doesn't make a lot of sense. There's going to be a lot of overlap, but we're not all the same. So here are some of the language groups that we can see. And I'll move my us over a little bit. So as you can see, as we move up the coast, you have Coast Salish and you have Kwakiwaks and Nachulith and Bella, and Haidas and Simpsons and Clinkets. And if you get up further north, then you get into Alaska. <laughs> then you have um, the Nupiaks and all sorts of different folks. And so uh, on this, the left map, you see the groups of people. Uh, and these are also language groups. You have Northern Lashootse speaking people, which is where my tribe comes from. Uh, Southern Lashootse speaking people, which is where my wife's tribe came from. Twanas speaking people, which are Skokomish and folks like that, you know, Sklalums and uh, Quinaults. The Macaws and Quileutes, they speak the same language as uh, the Julets speak. They're right across the water there. So these folks are actually pretty much the same people, but they speak a different language than these folks. Peter, how much are the languages still used in practice? Not much, <clears throat> not much, because we live in a beautiful area. And so that area was colonized pretty heavily uh, this, because it's beautiful and people here it's a great place to live. And additionally, because um, colonization had vast effects on, on folks. One is the um, attempted and forced assimilation, uh, not, just, not just killing folks to take their land, but also the removal of children from homes raised in boarding schools, foster care, things like that. And that started in the late 1800s and continued until 1978 with the Indian Child Welfare Act. So within my lifetime. Um, and then additionally today, indigenous children are overrepresented in foster care now in most states. Um, <clears throat> like in North Dakota, for example, where Indian children are 13% of the population, they represent 64% of the population in foster care. Mm can't tell me that, in, that Indian parents are that bad. So it's, a, it's an ongoing problem that has happened within Indian country. And it has had a profound effect on indigenous populations, it continues to have a profound effect on indigenous populations. You guys said it was going to be funny. <laughs> we'll get there. This is important. It's, it's, is, it's, it's really important and we care. So. 
Yeah. So anyway, those are the maps. This is kind of where we're talking about. Coast Salish is from here. If we're sp talking specifically uh, Tacoma area, we'd be Southern Lachutesi speaking pe people. So we'd speak the same thing as Northern Lachutesi, but there'd be some dialectal differences, kind of like we speak the same language that they speak in Alabama, but we don't understand what they're saying. <clears throat> because last time I was in Alabama, they told me to slow down. Real glad you said Alabama, not Texas, just to be clear. I just came from Texas. <laughs> Are you from Texas? <laughs> I, I am from, I say y'all a lot. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you, when you came back up here? Did you feel like your IQ jumped about four points? Oh, for sure, for sure. <laughs> okay. And w when you go back, do you have to slow down? Uh, not not in my crowd that I hang with. They're pretty good, but <laughs> you, you <laughs> must go to the Austin area, right? Uh, Dallas, Dallas, Dallas. Okay, Dallas, so. Fort Worth. Yep. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I've been there. I, I went with some friends and they had me go to McDonald's with them because it was the only place that was open. And I was, it was late. So we went in, there was only three or four of us. I think there was four of us. And, you know, you don't want to eat at McDonald's, but you know, you go to McDonald's for the consistency, not because it's good. And we were there in Texas and um, it was actually Dallas, Fort Worth area. <laughs> it was not far outside of there. And we walked in and we said, hey, yeah, we'd like to have a number one, a number seven, number nine, whatever. We're just giving the numbers out. And the, and the girl at the counter, she held her hand up to us. Now, just hold on. Y'all late from around here, are you? You need to slow down for me. And that was a very, very funny awakening. And so we slowed way down. And of course, they got the order wrong. But uh, yeah. That's my Dallas Fort Worth story. And then we got stuck in traffic. So um, let's talk about the differences between Coast Salish art and like Northern style form line. And you can see these differences. Does you get, is your screen, does this uh, one on the right side, is it obscured by the images? If okay. it does, everyone can move their own little box around. So we can oh. like, I can put mine in the middle or move it to the left or the right or the bottom. So if people have part of the screen block, just uh, hold your mouse and try to move that little box of people around. Okay, awesome. So what, uh, what we have here is we have three different salmon designs. They're very famous artists who created, uh, three different famous artists who have created these. We're, I'm going to start from um, right, then move to left. So on the right, we have a salmon design by Simpson father and son team, David Boxley and David R. Boxley. Pretty good friends of mine. And you can tell that it's a Simpson piece specifically by the design style. And they have these uh, ovoids. So the eyes, for example, the shape of the eye, that's an ovoid. And then he puts faces obscured. I believe the father did the the one on top and then the sun did the, the one on the bottom. And that's a Simpson style design. It's very classic Simpson. It has those really sharp lines, really sharp edges. Very well done, very beautiful, beautiful piece. The centerpiece is a Haida dogfish, it's like Haida salmon. This was done by Bill Reed. And it's an incredibly famous piece. I think this is the piece that uh, Justin Trudeau, the Canadian prime minister has tattooed on his shoulder. Uh, <laughs> This, this piece is, is a very famous, famous piece. And you can see the distinct style. Again, you have the ovoid for the eye and the ovoid in the tongue. Uh, you can see that there's a human figure in the body. And then again, there's another ovoid in the tail. And that, that forms, I believe that one forms a raven. Okay. Then we go to the left. And this is a salmon as well. This one was designed by Susan Point, who's a Coast Salish, she's Musqueam from Canada. And you can see that it's different. There's no ovoids in there, but we do have circles um, and crescents, which form the eye. We have a trigon or a V cut. You can see that in the white in the tail, uh, the little triangular shapes. You can also see that in the body right before the tail, those little black shapes, those are trigons or V-cuts. And then the S shape, which is in the 
in this particular shape, one, you can see it in the water right in front of the fish. So Coast Salish design is broken down into three, four really basic specific designs. We have circles, trigons, V-cuts, and S-shapes. Now, um, a lot of that was kind of, it disappeared for a long, long time due to uh, a lot of factors, a lot of reasons, colonization due to different things. Um, and it was revived in the late 70s. Coast Salish work started to come back in the late, late 70s. And it was revived by using historic uh, spindle whorls. And a spindle whorl, you can see this lady's uh, spinning wool. And Coast Salish people were really known and renowned for their, their wool and for their wool blankets and for their wool, they're essentially parkas, but they're, they're co coats. And that wool had to be spun some way. And the wool was, was derived, you, you got hair from dogs that were specially bred for wool. And they were kept separate from the other outside dogs. These were little inside dogs. They were little fluffy things from all accounts that looked like poodles in, in many. They're like little um, lap dogs with afros, essentially, is what they looked like. Little puff balls. And those were used a lot. And then also mountain goat uh, hair. And that could be collected without killing the goats by going up into the mountains where they rub up against rocks in the spring when they're shedding. And you can find and pick up large amounts of wool that way. Uh, you could do it on any of the mountains, Rainier and so forth, anywhere where goats were prevalent. So the spindle whorl, which is the disc that's on the stick, that was often very intricately carved, which you can see in the image on the upper right side. And it, those items, those utilitarian items survived the uh, impact of colonization, especially missionaries. A lot of missionaries would come in and they would destroy cultural items. Anything that was a religious item or a cultural item was often burned and destroyed. Whereas utilitarian items remained. And so most of the museum collections that are found are utilitarian style items like a spindle whorl. So in 1978, Stan Green, who's an amazing, amazing man, he created the first Coast Salish print. And what he did, and this is the print up here in the upper left. And um, he took a, he was looking at museum stuff and he took a spindle whorl that was in the museum. And he said, I'm gonna print that image. He's, he's gonna update it, modernize it and print that image. And so this is the image that he came up with. He later has carved that spindle whorl, which is down at the bottom left. And so Stan was the first one to create a, a modern Salish piece. And that was in 78. And Stan is a Coast Salish um, artist. And his tribe is actually called Salish out of uh, Canada, Vancouver, Canada. And he's a phenomenal, phenomenal man. 1979, Susan Point took the same spindle whorl and created another uh, print, but she did a different design off of it. And she started her career and probably became the most influential Coast Salish artist um, to date. She's done just amazing, amazing work. And she put Coast Salish work on the map. Any conversation about Salish work or Salish art isn't complete without including Susan's work. She has she is by far the, the one who's done the most Salish work. And so her early stuff started with spindle whorls. And then her later stuff is right what you see down below, where it's um, more conceptual, more abstract. And she does a lot of really interesting stuff. I personally love her early work. Her latest stuff is beyond my price point. So I don't really deal with it. But she's a very, very wonderful woman. Uh, she's very nice. In 1980, Andy Peterson, he took it a step further. He's a Skokomish, also known as Swanahout, the Shelton area, it's a port area. And he created the first Coast Salish design based on his family's stories. So he took family stories, historical stories within his family, and he created print work based on those. I don't have that a copy of that print work, but um, 
I'm pretty sure it was very similar to what you see on the left, which is one of hers, his more modern stuff. He also carved the welcome pole, which has now been updated, so it doesn't look like that anymore, at the Evergreen State College. And then the, um, he, along with Greg Colflex, who is a macaw, and he also carved the welcome poles at the Evergreen State College Longhouse. So this is Andy with, he's really well known as a carver. And um, I owe a great deal of my career and a great deal of gratitude towards Andy because he helped me get started. Um, he is my father-in-law's cousin and he started printing at his own studio. And I didn't know Andy very well, but I, I had a whole stack of paintings that I had done just on paper. And so I took my paintings over to Andy and I had heard he had started printing. And I said, hey, Andy, will you, uh, will you print these for me? Because it's, it's hard to get started as an artist when you're young and broke and you have no idea what you're doing. Um, but I'm old and broke and still have no idea what I'm doing. So maybe that's not the best example. But I said, hey, Andy, will you print these for me? And he said, no, you can come over here and print them yourself. So I, I did my, I printed my first four print series at his place and he provided ink and he provided paper and he was just so gracious with his time and with his expertise. And I didn't know at the time he was still trying to figure out how to print as well. So we were kind of learning together, but I am so grateful for that because it, it started me and it opened up all sorts of doors. Once I started printing, that's when my career took off. So I'm very, very incredibly grateful for Andy for his generosity for allowing me to work at his place. And ironically enough, I took one art class in college and it was for printmaking so that I could learn how to do water-based inks. And he had been using solvent-based inks when we first started. And then years later, Andy came to my studio to learn how to use water-based inks. So it was a very gratifying experience to say, yes, do whatever you need to do. Here we go, let's try this out. Because there is some, on a technical side, there's some difference between the, the inks. All right, so this is the thing Gretchen was getting excited about. It's about the Coast Salish design forms, graphic format and styles. With the upper left circles and ovals, they're pretty much interchangeable. We use circles and ovals a lot. And then crescents we use to create or look at circles and ovals. So we're going left to right up on top. And then on the upper right, these are the trigons. You're gonna find these over and over and over again. And we will manipulate trigons in a variety of ways. And we use them over and over and over again. And so the lower left, you see all of those shapes together. And then on the lowest lower right side, that's the S shape, which we use pretty regularly. But it, a, lot of, a lot of Coast Salish artists are like, that's not what we do. And, I'm like, that's what we do. So it really depends on where you're at. And there's, huge, there's different styles within Coast Salish work. For me, as a Northern uh, Coast Salish artist, as opposed to a Southern Coast Salish artist, I suppose, um, I use a lot of S shapes. I don't use, however, as many of the, so on the, the box on the lower um, left, the, the the middle line, far right, that shape there, I don't use that one very often. It's just one I personally don't use very often. Let's see here, I gotta move my box to move. That's right. Okay, so now we're gonna get into my work. This one is a piece of mine I did, I don't know, 2004 or five, six, something like that. And this one I call Birds of the Feather. I was really interested in figuring out um, how to flow more than, it. I wasn't really trying to tell a specific story. I was more interested in how to merge figures. So I've got about six or seven, see I've got an eagle and a raven and a hummingbird and a hawk. And then I hid a couple birds in there. So I've only got a few birds, maybe less than a dozen. And then I also have a sun and a moon. Oh, I should probably stop at this point and say, are there any questions up to this point? Everybody's up. 
So it means I'm either explaining things well or you're like, oh, let's hurry up. I don't want to be rude. He'll notice if I leave. I think you're explaining things well. So this one is called Birds of a Feather. It was eight foot by four foot on canvas. It is a pretty cool piece. Where is so, it hung? I'm sorry. Where is it hung? Oh, um, that piece is at the um, public defender's office on the Tulalip Tribal Courts. Okay. That's where it's currently at. Thank you. Yep. So these are rattles. Um, so a lot of folks, when when they started, so Susan and Stan and those guys did a lot of museum research and came up with their their own uh, interpretation of what they had seen in museums. And the second wave of, of artists, which I consider myself to be part of, a lot of those folks, they studied what Susan and Stan and, and artists of that generation were doing and they based their work off of their work. So it's like a, a second generation copy. I decided I was gonna do a lot of museum research of my own. I was gonna look at family history and come up with my own interpretation based on that rather than copy what other artists had done. And I became really, really interested in rattles because we had a lot of rattles that survived for some reason or another. And probably because drums didn't survive very well and rattles did. So I was trying to figure out and I continue to try to figure out how do I update rattles? How do I create something that is interesting and functional at the same time? So here are four rattles that I've done in the last few years. Upper left is a raven, then I have a loon, lower left is an orca, and then a grouse. And all of them are pretty modern interpretations. More rattles. And so upper left, that one I didn't have a specific bird in mind, just a Tweety bird is fine with me. It's a red cedar with yellow cedar inlay. It's an old growth red cedar, which is kind of hard to find. And I was really interested in the form and as well as the function, but really the form of it. I wanted to show off the wood. In the center is a, another raven, more of a, a mask style. Upper right, another grouse, but more of a contemporary grouse. That's a actual colors of a grouse, but um, stylized a bit. Lower right, is a red winged blackbird because they're cool and they make a lot of noise and they're fun to watch. And then lower left is a wolf with coyote hair, which was a roadkill. Um, I know that because I hate him. My car is okay. <laughs> I have to say as much as I don't like being on Zoom, it is much easier to see the pictures than it was on the big screen and the in the wherever we were so i imagine so it was it was really strange to see them from my point of view as well because they're in a giant screen right next to me peter can you share the significance of a rattle like is it um you know decorative or a baby rattle or what what are they used for they're used for singing potlatch songs for anything that you do with a drum, you can also do with the rattle. And so rattles are pretty significant. You find them every potlatch you go to, somebody's got a rattle. Um, and so there are two different styles of rattles or types of rattles. There's one that's a, a loud one that's you, you sing with a bunch of other folks. So well, if you have a drum group and somebody has a rattle, they're just using a rattle instead of a drum. Uh, that's a potlatch style, kind of a louder rattle. And then you have a, a more quiet personal rattle and that's more of a prayer, a prayer rattle. So they're used for prayer quite a bit, which is probably appropriate for this group. So Thank this you. is another rattle. This I won a few awards off of this one. Actually the head came out of the body. So the wolf, it's a wolf rattle and then the body is the stand and the arms are articulated, they could move. And then the little rattle that the, that the uh, body is holding was actually a rattle too, it functioned. So that, this is a really cool piece. Um, and then a button, button robe, wool button robe with a wolf design. So it's a wolf dancer. How big is this piece? About how tall? Eight inches tall. Okay, yeah, wow. 14, 16 inches tall, probably about, yeah, 
the oh. rattle itself is probably about a foot, something like that. Wow. So How long not, did it take you to make this piece? I was rushing this piece because I had a deadline and it took me about two weeks. And by two weeks, those are like 10, 12 hour days. So I don't know how many hours that is, but a lot, probably 100, 120 hours into it, something like that. Well, they're beautiful. Thank you. And then I followed that up the following year with a Raven Dancer uh, rattle. And it was very similar. This one is an articulated rattle. So the, the mouth would open and close like a clapper. And you could hold it closed or you could let it clap. And this one was made out of yellow cedar with abalone eyes and uh, cedar bark for the skirt. So woven. And my, my wife wove the skirt because I don't like to weave. So the fabric. Oh yes. What was the question about the fabric? You do the the put the fabric together too. You do the woodwork and the fabric, huh? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's, very it's all just, I've never really been much into creating limitations for myself artistically. I know that there are a lot of artists that are like, I'm a painter, I'm a potter, I'm a whatever they want to be, which is all fine and dandy i'm more interested in how do i how do i tell a specific story how does that what does that look like um in practice and in function and yeah. so whatever i have to do to create that i'll do that so i actually cut the shell too and i think i harvested this one uh that's pawa shell out of new zealand so i think i actually went and harvested the abalone and cut the shell and polished it so it's, wow. it's that yeah that's cool Wow, that's amazing. So another rattle, this one has an articulated tail. Um, this one is in a private collection in Oklahoma of all places. Um, and this was a specific commission piece. Somebody wanted one that you could see through. So I, I um, carved all the way through and inside the rattle parts itself were red glass. They're marbles essentially, and that looked like eggs. I don't know if I have a good picture of them, but you can see inside. And this was an alder rattle with the yew wood stand and abalone inlay. And the inlay in the tail was um, carved as well. And you can, you can, on the lower left, you can see a little face in there that's carved into the abalone. Has he said anything about his tool? You're unmuted. Oh. No. You can talk. Oh, I, I was wondering about your tool. I'm a, just a basic woodworker, you know, furniture and stuff. But I mean, I'm looking at your your woodwork there is it um you must use a, a lot of different things you use like a, a small uh, jigsaw to start to rough it in and then your knives and your carving tools or what do you, you so for it? my for the rough work i'll use a bandsaw and try yeah. not to cut my fingers off and yeah. then for the for the detail work i have a number of bent knives uh, bent wood or crooked knives bent knives i've got about 35 or so different knives <laughs> wow. it's it's never enough you always create more and <clears throat> um i've made some of, made some of my own knives i also have some really good friends who are knife makers so I, uh, sometimes if a blade is getting old or breaks or something like that i'll call them up and say hey, i need a new detail knife and they're like wow. which one i want to see ben that kind of deal <clears throat> wow. and i don't have any pictures but if you you can see me and just give me just a second and I'll grab them because I'm actually in my studio. So I can grab a couple knives cool. and show just a second. Tom, it's fun to have you here to ask those questions. <laughs> I wouldn't have oh. even thought to ask that. And it's like, oh, that's cool. I'm like, who is that? And then I figured yeah. out, oh, that's right. I was excited. Tom joined us. Yeah, as soon as I saw and, this, I was like, oh my gosh, I just thought and, yeah, Tom, you you underestimate your or you undersell yourself. Your work is pretty amazing too. Oh uh, man, nothing like that. I mean, this is just really something. I'll have to ask him again. If this is cedar again because I can't. It's very white, you know. I wonder if he bleaches it or something. I'll have to see how he gets that. What, what oh, when he this? when he gets right. back, ask because he wants it to be conversational. So these are great oh. questions. All right, how are we doing here? 
good. I was just wondering if this is also cedar, just because of the white tone of it, the, the light colored tone of it. This one is alder. Oh, it's, oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that makes sense. You can see how it's reddening on the uh, nose. Yes. Mm -hmm. After over time, it will kind of redden a little bit like that. But this was really, really fresh alder. Wow. So, you, I guess you don't have to worry about cracking and stuff, huh? Because it's, I guess you're with by putting the reliefs in it there and stuff, it, it's not going to crack on you. As long as I get it thin enough, fast enough, it shouldn't crack. Uh, but if it's fat like the head, yeah, it, there's a good chance that the head will crack. Um, mm -hmm. on this if I hadn't hollowed it out. I actually hollowed the head out just for weight. There's a really good chance it would have cracked. Right. So I don't know if you can see the knife I'm holding here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So this is a very, very strong bend. It's a, it's a really strong hook. I use this one for hollowing out the inside of a rattle. Um, this is as big a bend as I have. And then the handles, you can see how I have that handle carved and I hold it um, this like this so it's a wrist action of the thumb here you can see the thumb hold mm -hmm. that would be really hard to sharpen <laughs> so I sharpen it by using uh, something like this um, <laughs> a dowel with some uh, oh, okay. sandpaper like so I sharpen or something on it. Yeah, sharpen it with uh, 400 grit. And then on the outside, I, I use a, um, a polishing tool, uh, wow. like a Dremel with some, yeah. Uh, yeah, with some jeweler's rouge. And I, I pull that burr off of there. So as long as I get a nice uh, edge, and then I can polish it down. And I usually yeah. sharpen my knives in batches. So then we, we have another knife that has a little bit less of a curve on it. Mm -hmm. And again, the handle is dependent upon what I need it to be doing. Right. Uh, let's see if I got some straights in here. And this, this knife is probably the one I use as much as any other. It's really small. You can see that it's just a little bend. Detail, yeah, detail. A little detail knife. Real simple. This one doesn't have a very intricate handle. It's just a real straight. Look like you had a string holding the blade onto your last one. Was it? Like yeah, that, this one was made by a different uh, person and they've got a little screw in it. Yeah. Um, older style. So, something that I would make. This is what my handles would look like. Let me pull that back a little bit. This is another straight knife, really sharp detail knife. Mm -hmm. I've dropped this. I've dropped this on my leg once before. It wasn't pleasant. Um, you can see how the handle sits. So it fits my hand just perfectly because I created it specifically for my hand. And this one is is a detail knife. So. So you buy the blade separate and make your own handles. Well, I'll make the blade too. Um, oh, I did. Okay. I didn't make this particular blade. I had a, a friend of mine, but yeah, I'll bu I'll buy the blade separate and and do that, and then I'll trade, and we do all sorts of different stuff back and forth. Um, I, I actually won a set recently from a knife maker. In let's see. Oh yeah, I've got interesting handles. Here we go. I know we're probably going to run over time a little bit. So this knife I got from a, a friend mm -hmm. who bought it from um, somebody who probably shouldn't have had it. And this is, a, is an old, old knife, probably from the 30s. And I really, I don't actually use it much. I have reconditioned it, but I loved the handle of it. And so I've, I've uh, used this knife to create that kind of a pattern for a lot of handles. I just really like the handle of it. The blade itself is nothing special. I use it occasionally just to break it out, but um, yeah, I did. it was really rusted and beat up. He goes, hey, you want it? He goes, I'm not gonna use it. I, yeah, I'm scared of using something that's that old. I don't know what's been on it. And I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll use it. So I've done that. I also use like, a L yes. Do you mind? Um Closing out of your shared screen so we can see the oh, yeah. bigger image of the knife. We can certainly do that if I can figure okay, out. Thank you. Move my. Okay, here we go. Oh. 
if I could figure it out, I definitely will. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. I think if you just hit stop screen share, um, and then you don't, I think that should do it. I have moved my, I, I think it's at my the top. things around so that I, <laughs> so, it's all hidden. so I'm all jumbled up. Oh yeah, there we go. It is up the top. There we go. Can you see me now? Yeah, thank you. Uh, yep, since we're doing show and tell, which I wasn't really fully expecting. All right. Um, for Tom, since he's interested in knives, and I've, I'm not going to go what, through all. It's what happens when you have other artists in the group. <laughs> yes, this and this makes it interesting for me too, because then I'm not just going off of uh, rote memorization. Um, so this is a elk antler for, for a handle, and it's a straight knife. Really, this one, and I liked it just because it's got a nice little feel. I use this one a ton. It's one that I use frequently. And then we have another style of knife, a skew. See the blade there, and I use this one a ton. If you need to really push hard and get uh, some some stuff detail work out, some rough stuff. If you guys go to your view and click speaker, then you can get Peter like full screen. So I will go through and show you a couple of them since you want to see them full screen. So it goes all the way from a hook that's this crazy to a, a more gentle hook this one i use just tons and tons um and then something that's just like a straight knife as far as a handle with a really gentle cut on that another one that i use a lot to one that can be very the handle can look like this it's just really specific because i, I have want it to be a really specific grip those are the knives that I use. Um, some guys really like big giant handles for some for whatever reason. This is about as big a handle as I like. And again, this is another bent knife. Uh, they like to get a lot of torque into it, but I'm uh, I like a knife that's flexible and the the blade will flex. And I don't like a really thick bladed knife. I think that it gets a rougher cut. I'm I want to finesse my carvings rather than force them. You know, and I know some guys that really like the big, thick, heavy knives, and I just never liked them that much myself. Just personal choice, not anything specific. Any other questions about the knives and stuff before I start putting them away? No, I just said that you'd be more patient if you had smaller knives. I mean, it seems like if you're trying to do it carving fast you're going to use a bigger knife a smaller knife you need to be patient yeah we also use what's known as an ads which i can see from here but i can't reach with my headphones so i'm gonna grab that real quick i gotta go grab the couple knives now Like a hammer that's a blade. Oh, I'm serious. <laughs> yeah, there's a dugout canoe one there, huh? Yep. So this is a little uh, U ads, little scoop ads. So this will take out a lot of ADZE is an ad. This will take out a lot of uh, material real quick. So I'll use this in shaping a mask. And I've got a flat ads, to a straight blade. Uh, yeah. um, these are the handles I make these out of alder. It's a branch, so where the branch meets, and you can just get to handle it the way you want. I've got salmon skin on there to block some of the chips from coming in. Wow. That's crazy. I wouldn't, I mean, I just. Very impressed. <laughs> yeah. So, so have you done uh, like totems, or I know there's some issues with actually making totems, but um, that we're maybe not supposed to be actually making totems that have you i mean with a tool that large you've made bigger things in your delicate pieces that we've seen yeah i've made larger larger pieces i've worked with some other artists on large scale um carvings on some uh, house fronts and some mm -hmm. uh, welcome figures that we had i've worked on a couple of things like that but uh, large scale carving takes a lot of time and I'm not a guy that has a lot of time. 
I, you know, I've worked on canoes. So this is like a channel ads. This will take out a bunch of material really quick. So if you wanted to rough shape something out, this is what I would use. And I, I frequently do use this too. You could use those to do a dugout too. Yep. <laughs> yep. And these are actually just handheld small ads. They have much, much bigger ones for a dugout. And I've, I've worked on four or five canoes. So, yeah, something like that. A few. Okay. That was awesome. Thank you. Yeah. And then we'll also use uh, chisels and gouges and stuff for, for larger works, mm -hmm. which um, I also have laying around, but they're not that exciting. Mm -hmm. like, okay, I got to put these away. So I, the only time I really, and people ask me, so ask, do you cut yourself? I'm like, yeah, if you're a carver, you cut yourself. <laughs> and oh, is it terrible? I'm like, yeah. When do you cut yourself? Usually when I'm reaching for the tool. That's when mm -hmm. I usually cut myself. I rarely cut myself when I'm carving but it's not unusual at all if i'm reaching for the tool or if i leave them if i get in a hurry and i leave them laying around and i just reach over and you're like oh yeah yeah that one cut because I, I try to keep them as sharp as possible because dull tools are dangerous and sharp tools are less dangerous mm -hmm. and you can get a much better um result with a very sharp tool but the flip side of that is you touch it you get cut yeah yeah anyway i guess i can get back to the powerpoint again okay so here we are with that rattle that we've gone over so here are two separate rattles as well on the left i have these are uh, prayer rattles they're um reclaimed yellow cedar so they were a building for 50 maybe 100 years a long time anyway it got torn down and I took some of the beams that, well, a friend of mine got them and I took them and he said, here, try this out. I'm like, cool. And it's beautiful, beautiful wood, but when yellow cedar gets old, it gets really brittle. So it's hard to work with. You have to be really careful with it. So the, the rattles themselves are carved out, carved out of yellow cedar. The stand on the left, which is the male, that's also yellow cedar. The stand on the right, the darker one, that's out of cottonwood root. I've got a lot of friends in the Southwest who are uh, Hopi Casino char doll carvers. And they said, have you tried cottonwood? And I said, no. And they said, here, try some. And we're trading back and forth. And it's like cheating. It's so soft and it holds an undercut so well. Like, oh man, this stuff is great. So I'll probably be carving some more stuff out of it just because it's so easy to carve. Um, and then the mask is a slapu mask. It's a wild woman, a basket woman, also known as a basket woman. And most of the time, so Slapu, and she's whistling. And so the story goes is that she's kind of this ogre creature, lives in the woods, carries a basket around on her back. And she'll go, go around at night and she'll whistle, trying to lure children. And when she catches them, she'll grab them and throw them into her basket and try to take them home and eat them. But usually the kids are very clever and get away because she's not that smart. But most of the time, the, the mask is black. Uh, and with, with reddish eyes. I always think that white is scarier for a number of reasons. So I've used, I've used white. I'm the only person I know that does it. I'm breaking from tradition in doing so, but I, I use white whenever I create and carve one. So here's some bent wood boxes that I've done in the past. Um, left to right. Let's see, on the bottom left, we have a bear. Above it, we have a thunderbird, another thunderbird upper uh, right. And then well, that was a, a number of birds on that lower box. The center, upper center is a bent wood box drum, which is four feet by, I don't know, two feet. It's a big, big, big thing. Um, and that's the inside of the drum. Down below is a detailed shot of another um, box design. Then on the right, this was another prayer rattle that was many, many years ago. And I used a bentwood box as the stand. Um, so that's, that's what those are. And did you say last time that's horsehair? Yes. Yep. 
yeah, there's a horsetail uh, hair. I like I like the gray color. And when I ran are, out of, are the clam shells what she's? Those are deer hooves. Um, they're they're the dew claws of a deer actually, but they're deer oh. hooves. So okay. historically, we'd have a lot of rattles that would use deer or elk hooves to create that rattling sound. Okay. Yeah. And then I think, let's see, the, the necklace was, um, the white was mother of pearl, the black was glass beads, and then the red on the necklace was coral. Uh, I'm trying to think what that's called when it's petrified coral. I can't remember. Some, there's a jewelry term and I can't remember exactly what it is. So here's some of my print work. Um, and I really like to do embossing which you see. And so these are some of my more recent pieces. We're gonna get into more and more recent as we go through this, I believe. So up on the left, we have a frog in night sky with the moon and embossed moon in the corner. We've got some moths and I threw mosquitoes in there. The reeds have faces. They're singing a song to the moon. I actually embossed trees in the background, but you can't see them because I would just try stuff. And so I carve a, a blank out of uh, linoleum when I emboss. Um, <clears throat> and then I run it through an old intaglio press. The press was, it's from the early 1900s. I don't have an exact date. It's old, it's heavy. And I like it, but it's, I can't do a big things out of it. On the right side, I have a, um, otter, sea otter holding her baby with a moon again in the upper left corner and then a old weaving pattern of geese right above the embossed geese right above the um, otter. So these are actually new pieces. The one left to right, we've got an orca with a human figure in the body and it's exhaling or breathing out uh, that water that's embossed in the water is an upside down human. So it's a breath of life is what that piece is called. That one is a new piece. I did it in December. So it's a fairly new piece. It's called pivot. These are all pandemic pieces. I've got an embossed sun at the bottom. And this one is this year's piece sometime in this winter or spring. And then I have a acrylic on canvas painting of snow geese. I just wanted to try it. I don't have any specific you know, reason. You know, I'm upper Skagit and Skagit Valley. We have a bunch of snow geese that come through uh, in the spring when you go out there. And, and by themselves, they're really kind of boring. But as a flock, they're pretty amazing when you see a million of them take off and fill the sky with this white and black and all their noise. It's lovely. Thank you. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the, the center one? So is that like a, um, is that an eagle or? Yeah, so it's an eagle as it's changing directions. So I, I like to go out on the water as often as I can. I like to kayak and, and go on a canoe or whatever. And I have seen eagles that'll be chasing something or flying after something and they will just pivot. They'll just change direction on a dime, but their head will kind of remain flat. And so there's, mm -hmm. Boom. And I've seen them do that. And it took me, a, I always wanted to create an image of them changing direction. And I probably went through 20 or 30 different sketches before I came up with this one. To, it was just a really difficult design for me for whatever reason to come up with. And I'm really happy with this particular one. Um, yeah. And so yeah, this is, a, yeah, it's just changing direction and doing its thing. I kind of liked it because for some reason, to me, the ends of the wings reminded me of like loons too, like a, you know, like a double, a double thing going on. You know, does that make You'll sense? You'll see that in a lot of my, my work where I'll put, um, because that's that S shape and then the, mm -hmm. the circle, I'll put a lot of that into uh, um, my work. The circle it has multiple meanings. One is that's a future generation. Oh. I, I like to do that, but you can see that I also did that in Orca. So oh, I, yeah. so you can see where the, the dorsal fin, which is like our arm, it also forms another, either a bird or a fish. Oh, sure. Okay. Right, right. And then you see that in the tail. 
Um, and then those little circles for me personally, this isn't a Salish thing specifically, but for me personally, those little circles are a prayer. I, I, so I put them in my work all over the place. Amen. Yeah. Um, two more pandemic pieces. The left is a hawk uh, and with its wing kind of held out and, and feathers spread like, like uh, fingers. And the, the coloration of it is like fire. So going through difficulty and fire and coming out stronger. The one on the right, I wanted to do I really like doing abstract stuff. It doesn't sell as well, but I really enjoy doing it. So this is a, a painting and it, it sold right away, which is kind of strange. Uh, so I've got a sun shine over the mountains. So the sun is the circle and then the crescent and trigon, that's the sunlight coming down. Then the triangular pattern, so those are old, that's an old basket pattern. And then the circle is again, um, multiple meanings on that. So that's both the, the life, uh, snow, water is life, but it's also a prayer. And then I included the Big Dipper in there because I wanted to have the, the heavens as part of uh, that particular image. Something that people could, and a Big Dipper is something that people understand. You know, if I put Orion or something else, people would, would know, but Big Dipper, they can see it. They're like, hey, I know what that constellation is. Um, I'm not, like I said, I'm not really a, or maybe I didn't say, I'm not really much of a spindle world guy, but I have done tons and tons and tons of drums. And so on the right side, I've got a drum of dragonflies and right, the lower right, those are hummingbirds. And it was a drum design originally, it's now a print design. So the little dots, the little brown dots in the green, uh, those are eyes as they're feeding on the flower. And then on the outside of it, you can see the green. Those are the wings as they're, as they're um, flying and still feeding on a flower. And then the reddish color, that's a flower and it's turning into a hummingbird showing that symbiotic relationship between them. So it's a repeated pattern and those are hummingbirds. And it's that play with negative and positive space. <laughs> and then the, the large mask, that's the sun mask uh, out of uh, yellow cedar. More contemporary stuff, uh, a longboard. This is actually available still. It's at the Stonington Gallery in Seattle. It's uh, crabs and octopus. And I didn't have any real deep meaning behind it. Uh, I just wanted to kind of play around with crabs and octopus. And on the right, what I did is I included uh, regalia. And so these are singers, but I took the singers out. I took the, the human element out of it. And I wanted to do a different style of painting to people. It's funny, I get teased by artists. Other, They're like, can you really paint or can you just do design stuff? And I'm like, I can paint. And so I'll, every now and then I'll bust out a painting that's like this more of a realistic thing, but I like to play with it. So this is for Galia. These are people who are uh, singers and they've got drumsticks and they've got cedar hats and they've got woven uh, vest with abalone or like a, um, a button robe or in the case of the white one, that would be a woven um, vest that was, would be pretty highly sought after. And then different styles of drum. That's in a private collection. And that was acrylic on canvas. Um, old dance staffs, I did these ones probably 20 years ago. And they were based on something I had done. Uh, again, rattles with the deer hooves as a rattle and horse hair. And these were based on museum pieces that I'd seen. And I, it wasn't a direct copy, but it was pretty close. Um, the image, the, the print image, this is a raven flying through a cloud, uh, releasing the sun. I designed this piece about the same time I was designing just about ready to graduate from um, law school, so 2011. And the Idle George Museum in Indianapolis had asked me to help them with some fundraising stuff and they wanted a design to use. 
and they wanted something new and they wanted something that was meaningful to me. I'm like, oh yeah, let's make it easy. Um, and so I did this piece and the story is a Haida story about R Raven releasing the, uh, stealing the sun and releasing it to the sky and bringing light to the world. So the sun had been held in a box uh, in the underworld by an ogre and the raven snuck in and stole it and, and grabbed the sun and released it into the sky. And in the process was burned and turned black. And for me, it was kind of doing this self-reflection of thinking about my life at that moment going, how did I make it here? How, how is this even possible? I'm a kid, I grew up on the Northern Ute Reservation in Utah, uh, looking like I am. And most of my friends that I grew up with, the vast majority of them are, are, are dead. And I am the only one that made it to college, let alone did anything else with my life. And I was like, how, why am I any different than, than any of these folks? And, and how is it that I, I've done this? And you know, I was graduating uh, law school at the time and I was being fairly successful. I'd shown all over the world with the art. And it's like, why am I any different? And then I thought about it and it was the same thing. It's like, why did the Raven have the audacity to believe that he could steal the sun and release it to the world? And it was just that audacity of belief. Uh, the first time I got into a um, gallery, I walked in, I had four pieces and I said, hey, I really want you to look at my work. You know, I introduced myself, said who I am. And they're like, no, we're not interested in buying anything. I'm like, I don't want you to buy it. I just want some critique. No, no, we're kind of busy. We have come back later. I said, I'm, I'm here now. I came a long way. Would you please look at it? No, no, no. And they're like, fine. They're just trying to get rid of me. They bought all four pieces. Um, I didn't know that's not how you're supposed to do it. I, I just didn't have any clue. I, I didn't know that there's like protocol and procedure. I had no idea. First time I got into a major show, I got into the Smithsonian. They had a show that was coming up. They put a call out. I just applied and like threw some pictures in and I didn't know what I was doing. I got in and it was front. It was just having the audacity of, of trying and I'm not really good at quitting. I'm, I'm completely used to failure. It's, it's a constant companion. And it's kind of like baseball, you know, if you're batting 300, that means 70% of the time you're not, you're not getting on base. And, but that's still pretty good. And I kind of look at life a lot along those terms. And so this piece reminds me of that audacity to just live and try stuff and do different things. And it's worked really, really well for me in my life because I don't focus on the failures, which are vast. There's a mountain of those, but I, I do focus on the things that have been success, successful and I try to build on, upon it. Um, I haven't gone through this PowerPoint since the last time we've seen it, except for I added a couple on the end. So Coast Salish work is in Northwest coastal art. is really well known for being red and black. I'm a contemporary guy in a contemporary world. These pieces are not all red and black. The one on the bottom is, but not the rest of them. No, he's just, he'd come here a minute, would you? So um, we'll go from right to left on this one. So the one on the, the right is a singer. So he's singing this song and the, the little bubbles that are coming out. My kids are like, he's blowing bubbles. I'm like, yeah, that's his song coming out. And then that full screen. And so then these little wavy lines, I actually took that idea from a guy named uh, Joe Geshek. He's a uh, Ojibwe artist and he had done some stuff and I just loved his stuff that he had done. And he always had these little wavy lines and he used those as kind of this, this prayer from the, the earth to the heavens type of idea. So I took that, that idea and I really wanted to incorporate it in a piece. And so I did that. What's interesting to me about this piece is I actually designed it in class in law school when I was in property class, um, Bob Anderson. I am really bad at taking notes, but as long as, as long as I can keep my hands busy with something, um, I'm one of those fidget spinner type of guys. As long as I can have something in, in my hands then I can remember what's going on. 
So we were talking about adverse possession in this particular, when I was designing this particular piece. And I remember it pretty well because I designed this piece. And I ended up giving him a, one of these. And he loves to tell that story about how I designed it in his class. <clears throat> so the, the one in the center, these are hummingbirds on a, on a vine. And this is the result of a trip I took to Cuba. I was doing some um, environmental research there. And there's a vine out in the woods in Cuba that was just this beautiful purple, really, really deep. But the further away, and it grew, grows on a tree, and the further away from the tree it got, the flowers got lighter and almost silver. So I wanted to incorporate that. And then they have a, a hummingbird that's endemic to Cuba. It's only found there. And it's actually these colors, red, blue, and green. And so I wanted to, to create, and it had a split tail, like a, like a swallow. So I wanted to create that design as a response to my trip to Cuba. Upper left, this one is called uh, Tranquility. I did this design in a time of real chaos and turmoil in, in life. And I wanted to create a design that is tranquil and, and probably completely opposite of the way I was feeling. And it, so it's those little Tweety Birds. And I didn't have a specific species in mind. It could be a chickadee, it could be something else. But wherever I've gone in the world, there's always a bird that fills that niche, the kind that fly around and through chain link fences, or if you're sitting at a bus stop, they're going to be pecking around your feet. Uh, I love watching them. And I love the way they kind of fly in these flocks of movement. And so I wanted to, to create that feeling of tranquility. And so that's where that came from. So it's a completely traditional design style completely contemporary color palette. And then the one with the ravens on the bottom, I did that one for my wife when she was uh, graduating from her master's program. Uh, they had, I think it was 17 graduates. However many birds there are, that's how many graduates. Uh, it was an indigenous program and with their master's degree. And they didn't have anything planned for, for these students. And I thought this is kind of a shame, you know, we, these guys have come from tribal communities and they're doing this great thing. They're getting this master's of public administration. They have nothing planned. So we did, we created this print as a fundraiser so that they could have a party for their graduation. And we were able to throw a party at a local casino and have a big dinner and buy some rooms for some of the graduates. And it was, it was pretty well received. So that was cool. Um, this is a painting series I had done, uh, Star Children. So our origin story from my tribe is that the first peoples came to heaven on falling stars or on lightning. So I was wondering what that spirit of a falling star would look like. So I took that idea and I created these images, but I also went from youth to old age, from sunrise to sunset, different seasonal things. And then in the bodies, those are all basket designs or old basket designs. So I wanted to go from historic to contemporary as well. Uh, more contemporary designs. So the centerpiece, I love this one particularly. It's again, our origin story about uh, people coming to earth, bringing light to the world. And this is lightning. So it's called Thunder Child, the first people coming, bringing light. So he's riding down on lightning. Then I have falling stars on the sides on the on the right with the uh, the yellow and orange, that's a mountain. So the cedar hat represents the peak of the mountain. Then I have the wavy lines, so that's a river that's coming off a mountain. And then the little triangular shapes, those are old basket designs for mountains, mountain range. I have a raven that's coming from darkness, going towards light, coming out of there. So we have the head, the little face that you see up, up on the center at the shoulder um, of, the, of the left wing. And then as you come on down, you know, that little other shapes, you see the other wing and the foot down, down below. So it goes from darker to lighter. All right, now we're getting to more. The piece on the right, it's a Thunderbird. That's a painting that I did this year. All the yellow glows in the dark, so that's pretty cool. Um, so it's a thunderbird going through a cloud, and it has all this lightning that's char charging and building up in its body. 
And then the faces you see are all on the, the face in the chest and then on the elbow joints and then on the tail joint. So we'll put faces on a joint. A lot of times when you see a face in the body of an animal or something, it's on a, either a shoulder or a, a hip or some kind of joint. It usually indicates where a joint is at. On the left, we've got a thunderbird and a whale. And we have a lot of stories in this region about thunderbirds and whales, about how they thunderbird will uh, capture a whale and deliver it to people. Or sometimes they'll get into this big uh, fight and create tsunamis and earthquakes and things of that nature. So this is the clash, kind of a clash of the titans type of deal. And the whale is giving up, is not uh, giving up easily. They're pretty equally matched. And in the tail of the whale, I have a moon. In the tail of the thunderbird, I have the sun to show that balance and harmony between things. And there, there's more hidden in that design as well. All right, these are all pieces from this year. Anyway, so left to right, I have lightning. The, I've got another piece that's on canvas. It's um, salmon. And then as a result of the piece from earlier, there was a gallery in uh, Hood River, Oregon that said, hey, can you paint something up that's similar to, that has a river in it? And I was like, yeah, we could do that. And so this is the result of that. It's a large, that's a five foot painting by three foot. Um, and it's a river coming off of the mountains. And then the far right, that is a um, elk antler necklace. So made out of spike elk antlers. The beads are old trade beads and then African trade beads are the more modern ones. And then a mask, a carved mask. And the hair is actually made out of buffalo uh, hair from the chin because I was looking for a hair that was different and soft because it's a necklace. Now, that, that was a cool necklace. And I actually carved that necklace um, on Zoom meetings because I got so busy with all of these Zoom meetings. Like I said earlier, I need to do something with my hands. And so that necklace was carved entirely on Zoom that nobody saw me doing it. All right, so contemporary pieces. Um, I ended up printing the one so that the upper right is my print, one of my print racks with a print in progress. It's all done. Below it is a loon in progress. Um, I think I might still have that one actually laying around somewhere. Below that is, you can see the uh, two rattles I had been carving on. One's a blue jay, the other one ended up being the rattle that's on the left here which has three different pieces. So it actually comes out of the body. The rattle itself is made out of uh, red alder. The stand that is the shoulders and stuff, that's Pacific redwood. And then below it on the base of the stand is Port Orford cedar. It's also known as uh, white cedar. It's terrible to carve, but it makes beautiful stands. Um, did tell you shells mirrors, glass mirrors. Let's see what else I have in there. The uh, necklace is uh, cedar bark. And, yeah, pretty cool piece. I still have that piece. So then I, um, last time Gretchen saw me, we were getting ready to do a mural. And so I came up with a mural and this is where the Spaceworks comes in. They have been doing mural projects throughout Tacoma. What they started doing is um, any of the boarded up buildings that they have, they'll hire artists to paint on the boarded up sections in these mini mural projects. And then I just did the first mural, large scale mural that they've uh, done. And I just finished it a couple of weeks ago. It's on 10th and Pacific in Tacoma. And we'll get and show some of that. But the painting on the left was my original idea for the mural. I said, hey, let's paint it. So I painted it up and they're like, yes, we want that. We want that. We want that. And I'm like, cool. It's not going to be exactly like this, but here's the idea. And then so the center, that's the mural in progress and different steps along the way. And to show you how tall it is, it's 26 feet by 20 feet wide, I believe it is. So it's a, it's a fairly large two-story mural. 
And then I've got different indigenous women here who are putting their handprint on there and I will explain that momentarily. So here's a mural my son and I did and designed. This is completed work. <clears throat> and so um, again, it's 10th and Pacific, right across from Pita Pit for those of you who go downtown Tacoma, old Tacoma. It's at the, that's a parking garage that goes from, I don't remember the cross street, but uh, it's a state parking garage. So originally I wanted to do the, I didn't want to do a big, I wanted to do the sun up in the upper right hand corner. But if I look, if you look on the left, right above that, you can see this beam and it's a metal beam that supports the thing. And it has a rust line that drips down the center of the piece. And part of my contract says that I'll maintain the mural for two years. Um, and I didn't want to have to get up on a lift because I don't enjoy that. I'm not a big fan of heights. And I didn't want to have to touch up a painting just because of a stupid rust strip that goes because of this drip that goes down. So I just did the image and created the, the sun in the center that's the same color as the rust strip so that if if the water drips down with rust and I don't have to touch it up, it's just going to be part of the design. So that's the main reason, but it still fit with what I wanted to do with the design. So the center of it is the sun bringing light to the world. Then I have uh, Mount Rainier, known as Mount Tahoma, to show that it's the place. Um, and then I've got uh, in the in the black, you can see those, that's a goose pattern. It's an old weaving pattern, Salish weaving pattern. Up the clouds, it's kind of that little uh, gray on gray border. Below the clouds, I have um, mountains, and each, each of the mountains has a different face in it to show that the mountains are guarding out, watching over us. And so the faces, one looks directly ahead. Uh, actually, two of them look uh, directly, two look down, one looks directly ahead, uh, two look up, and then one to either side. So they're looking all around. Below the mountains, we have salmon. Uh, the one on the left is a male, the one on the female, uh, the one on the right is a female. In the body of the male salmon where the ribs are, those are uh, past salmon, those are ancestors. The body of the female contains eggs, those are future generations. So below that we have a frog with two guardian figures and the frog represents change and, and continual change in, in process. And then on the sides of it, uh, I don't know if I added more, nope. Uh, on the sides, we also have these little uh, crescents and trigons and circles. That's a stylized image of a, of a human or a person. And I did, we did 10 of those. And then we put the handprints on there, the red handprint that you can see. And that's for murdered and, and uh, missing indigenous people, which is a huge problem in the Indian country. Uh, we have thousands and thousands of missing indigenous uh, women and, uh, and youth and, and men as well. We are probably among the largest uh, demograph of missing people in the United States and most of it goes unsolved. So I've got 10 of those and I had 10 different women come and put their handprint on there. The stars, there are 215 of them. And those represent the first, um, I, I don't wanna say discovery, it's recovery of bodies from one boarding school up in Canada, Candeloup boarding school, 215 children. Something that's well known in Indian country, but probably not as well known amongst everyone else. And there are just so many children that have gone, uh, that were taken from homes and never made it back. And we we're up to well over a thousand, or I think it was 6,000 last check just in Canada alone. 
and that's they're only they're less than uh, ten percent through the schools. They haven't even gone through the schools in the United States yet. So I wanted to include those children in the mural because that was important to me and my family. And, and if I'm correct from my Canadian friend who was just kind of exploring this and finding out about it, it's not that historical. It's a lot more recent than we would ever want to admit. My grandparents and my, my parents went to boarding school. Yeah. Um, they weren't they weren't closed down recently. They, this was seventy eight. Yeah, uh, was was when the Indian Child Welfare Act took effect, and there are still six boarding schools in the United States. Right, um, right. That are operating today. So, yeah. this is not ancient history. This is not at all. Yeah. This is very much um, current modern history. Yeah. And then we're at the last, so I wanted to acknowledge the folks that um, I, I borrowed their work for this. Uh, Stan Green, Susan Point, uh, so Boxley's, Andy Peterson, Steinberg Gallery, uh, Burke Museum, folks like that. Is there any that, that you guys want to go back to or any questions at this point? Mm -hmm. I know it's left at this like downer downer note. I really, I really enjoyed though the one of the eagle and the whale. Yeah. And how you could see that that eagle was in that position that you like if it was going to grab a fish or something. You know, it's just the you just made it come so to life in that picture. I just think that is absolutely wonderful. And I love how wonderful how each of your I love the stories in the art. I mean, I just every time I look at your art, I want to hear you explain it because I love yeah. the the symbolism and the stories and the history and the layers in your art. No, there's no, no. so much beyond the visual, which is amazing. Come here. Thank you. Uh, I, I get bored with just having just a a thing it seems kind of boring to me i don't like posed images either it's just I, I get bored with that real quick well it seems like if you do when you do go away that you always stay true to the 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 salish form you know you you can there's parts of it you know you explain to us um that it still stays true i wonder why they in that same picture to the right of the uh the is thunderbird to the right of the whale um, eagle picture, yeah, they're both thunderbirds. Um, so oh, the different thunderbird. Yeah, they're both thunderbirds. And so, and, why do they? Why do you? Why the faces on the joints? What's just the? It it's kind of um, I don't really know exactly why, but it's it's a more of a traditional thing. That's the way that it's been for thousands of years. Right. Now, I don't know exactly why, but I do know that. Uh, what the faces represent. And this is kind of this puzzle that we face as indigenous artists where we go, why do we have this particular thing? Mm -hmm. that, that knowledge is often lost. And I was doing a show in New York and there was a um, Mohawk um, quilt, actually. She's a quilt artist and she had the same face that we use. And I asked her, I said, what is, what's that face mean? And she goes, oh, that's a voice of the future. That's a prayer. And I was like, ah, that, that makes perfect sense. That, of course that is. It, it's it's an image that I had used for a long time. I had asked a lot of artists around here without any real satisfactory answer. And I'm like, of course, it just fit perfectly into the narrative. And so that's that's what I do with it. Um, I just put that face there as, as a prayer, as a movement, as life. It's, I don't know if prayer is the right word, but it's it's life, it's movement. It's um, the act of being alive. Hmm. Wow, that's fascinating. <laughs> fascinating. Your, your work Peter, is amazing. Are there any galleries down here in the South Sound that carry your work? Let me think about that. <laughs> um, the Art Museum just had a big display, but is that over? 
Oh yeah, they they have some of my work in their gift shop, uh, I think, or they used to. They and yeah, that that show is over. That ended uh, end of August. Okay. Um, South Sound. There aren't a lot of galleries in the South. It's it's the strangest thing. Uh, I'll do a show in Seattle, and people from Tacoma will go up to Seattle to buy the work. If I do a show in Tacoma, there's just not that much support um and there aren't a lot of there aren't a ton of galleries in tacoma that i'm aware of that are that are kind of i, I tend to be a high-end artist and I, I price myself out of a certain type of gallery mm -hmm. and and so tacoma seems to be a lower end market not not because it's not because of the people in tacoma it just it just seems to be that's what's available so I've carried work in Olympia and it hasn't really sold that well, but I do carry work in uh, Stonington and Steinbrick galleries in Seattle and in the, there's a new gallery that's popped up and I can't remember the new Sacred Circle Gallery. They're, they're also in Seattle. That's the name. Thank you. Yep. Your son, and, um, your son, is he, um, does he have, does it run in the genes? Does he enjoy it? Does, is he, is that going to be his future or is he, um, did he just help you out? He has, I think we've got four or five print works out of him. He's a better artist than I was at that age. He's got better wow. control. He's a more naturally gifted artist. He's probably less interested in it than I was. <laughs> Uh, so I don't push him into it. If he wants to do it, he can do it. And he's starting to show more and more interest in it, especially as he sells work. And he's like, oh, I can actually do this. And so I'm excited to see what happens with his work as he progresses and as he does stuff. He's the one that designed, and we're actually uh, working on a, um, right behind us, the picture of us that's all boarded up. We're going to paint that this weekend. There's another mural that he designed completely cool what's your favorite medium do you enjoy the painting more or the wood type work and and the same with your son where does he seem to be excelling he likes to do digital stuff which is something i don't do at all and he likes to do he he's likes he likes to sew he likes to do fabric stuff uh, um mm -hmm. he hasn't really gotten into carving much but he's expressed an interest a bit and yeah so he's expressed an interest in carving but he hasn't really sat down and said hey let's carve uh, but i think he he enjoys the painting side of it i think a bit more me personally i don't really have a choice i don't really have a favorite i i like to do whatever i'm in the mood for doing <laughs> I, and i and it's not one of those there's there's kind of two a couple different ways to look at it. Some folks are like, where's your inspiration? And I'm like, ah, oh, that's for amateurs. I just go and do work. I just get to work. I have an idea. Let's get to work. And there's never enough time to get through all of your ideas. The other thing is I'm really interested in what best fits whatever the idea is. Mm -hmm. And I'll have ideas that will pop float around in my head. And sometimes I'm like, I, there's no way I can execute that right now. I'm really busy. Let's do a print version of it. You know, um, just go away. And, and so it just bounce around for a long, long time. And then other times, yeah. like, I really need to get this thing done. Yeah. Just, uh, wow, I, I really need another hummingbird design because I just sold out of them. So something like oh, that. Yeah. that. That happens pretty mm -hmm. regularly as well. Yeah. <laughs> Peter, this is off off subject, but what is your your what kind of lawyer are you and what do you do in that part of your life? I'm a pretty terrible lawyer. I'm, I'm <laughs> one that nobody wants to hire. Um, <clears throat> so I I am a public defender right now and I'm the primary public defender for Muckleshoot for their tribal court. So in the criminal cases, I have been the uh, primary public defender for Tulalip Tribe's uh, drug court, their drug treatment court for the last six years. It's a two-year drug treatment program. And I really enjoy that, actually. Uh, we get to take people who are uh, 
really dependent, uh, chemically dependent, really highly addicted and have uh, issues, legal issues that are always kind of a result or re revolve around their dependency issues. So if they weren't on drugs, they wouldn't be in the court system is kind of the idea. We send them to treatment, we deal with them on a weekly basis. Uh, we break them down as human beings and build them back up to, so we'll give them job training and push them through education and do a number of things. Um, and so that's a very gratifying job. It's one that as a public defender, I never win because they have to basically plead guilty to get in. And the only time that it's a success is if they graduate, whereas if they are removed from the program, my best uh, chance is to argue so they have less jail time. So but it sounds like it's very important work for an attorney. So we're glad you're there doing it. Yes, I, I am doing that, that a lot. People that need an advocate to believe in them. Yep. Yeah, so I do that. I was just hired as a pro tem judge for uh, Sox Waddle Tribe. So I'll be doing some family law stuff with them. And I also am a mediator. Um, I have my own mediation business and uh, the last year or so it's been mostly uh, child custody and divorce issues with mediation because people don't quarantine well together. <laughs> so uh, there's, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of that. Uh, I did seven or eight divorces last year and I'd only done a few prior to that. So I'm getting caught up on divorce law pretty well. Uh, originally I wanted to just do environmental law because I have a master's in environmental studies, my undergraduates in ecological agriculture. I was really interested in environmental work. I took every environmental law class out there and then I graduated at the height of the recession and there were just no jobs available. And the jobs that were being offered were terrible corporate jobs, working 80 hours a week and making less than what I was making as an artist working 20 hours a week. So it was like, do something you love for 20 or 30 hours a week, do something that would make you absolutely miserable for 80 hours a week for the same pay, which do you do? <laughs> it, was, it was a very difficult choice. Well, so, I'm glad you found your way to both. The, the two careers in some ways seem very dichotomous, but in other ways they seem so harmonious, so. It just, it works for me. So I'm a halftime lawyer, halftime artist. And then uh, occasionally I will teach. I, I was teaching for about seven years um, off and on as a professor in school. I, I did teach this year. I taught in the spring. I taught um, federal Indian law and uh, federal governance. So I have, I, I can teach about, I think I've taught about 15 different courses under broad range umbrellas. Uh, indigenous studies, law, environmental studies, and then some art stuff. And when I was hired as an art teacher, I said, I do not have an art degree. I don't know anything about teaching <laughs> art. I didn't take any art classes. And they said, well, you've been a professional artist for 20 years and you have a better career than all of our art degree teachers. So you're good to go. <laughs> <laughs> Valid point. Valid point. They were like, we, we looked at your portfolio and it's better than our accredited teachers with MFAs, so you'll be fine. I'm like, okay. <laughs> well, I, I, I want to say thank you. This was excellent. I just continue to be amazed. I'm so glad you came, small group and all. Well, thank you everyone for attending. Um, don't forget free will offering. Um, you can give online or send it to the church or just contact Robin or I and we'll help you figure out how to get your money where you want it to go. And um, we, we love to support the community and support things that are important to our speakers. So um, thank you so much, Peter. And uh, we may be in touch for future, you got my mind going. I'm like, there's a lot of things we could connect with, so. Indeed. Well, thank right. you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you for all your questions. Thank you, that was thank you so much.